Hi, and welcome to episode seven uh, of Who's Zooming Who. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this week, I am talking to Catherine Cronin from the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education. Nash, uh, Catherine was involved, um, and will talk to us um, a bit in a minute about the recent index survey that was just released. Um, and we're also going to talk about a webinar that's coming up uh, just next week, in fact, on uh, open educational resources, because um, OER and open uh, materials are uh, something very close to Catherine's heart. Catherine will do a far better job than I would introducing herself, so I'm going to hand you over to her right now. Catherine, you're very welcome. Ken, thank you so much. Uh, delighted to be here. I, uh, you've had a lot of illustrious guests so far, so I'm just delighted to join them. Uh, and thanks for doing this. Uh, it's really, it's really um, a great gift to us all, you know, that you're sharing all these stories with us. Um, yes, I am. I work for the National Forum, and since for about the past 18 months. But I suppose, like many of us, my my route to what I'm doing now is a bit circuitous. I I did uh, two degrees in engineering and worked in the computing industry for a little while. Um, I worked as a community educator for several years. Um, initially with um, women in rural areas who were wanting to return to work uh, through you know, and learn some IT skills and confidence to return to work, as well as people, other people in marginalized communities, uh, again, around IT skills. I was a tutor and lecturer with the Open University, uh, working at teaching women's studies and um, social and technological issues of information technology back in the 1990s worked on, I think it was the first OU course that used an online conferencing system, 1995, 1996, which was very interesting. Um, I've done research on women in STEM, um, but probably, you know, since the early 2000s, I've been really been working in digital education. And I worked at NUI Galway for 18 years, um, as lecturing in IT, but also I was academic coordinator for their online uh, masters in IT. I think Sharon Flynn talked about that as well. So Sharon was a colleague of mine on that. And I was academic coordinator for that, really supporting the people who were online facilitators uh, in you know, creating and building online community in these, in these wholly online courses, uh, as well as developing and redeveloping a series of, of online modules. Um, in, in the mid 20 teens, I spent four years uh, doing my PhD in open education, because as you said, uh, my practice had become increasingly open. I often describe myself as an open educator and open researcher at heart. Um, and that was deeply gratifying. And a uh, shout out to all the late career PhD students and researchers that might be out there. Uh, de demanding and deeply rewarding is, is how I would probably best describe it. And then since the end of 2018, as I said, I joined the National Forum, which has been such a joy um, because it's, the National Forum was part of my work for so many years, just you know, as someone in an institution uh, involved in teaching and learning. But to be part of you know, a really super team and to collaborate you know, across the higher education sector um, around digital and open education uh, you know, has, as I said, it's been deeply rewarding. And I suppose a lot of the work that I've done in recent years in open education, i had been collaborating closely with people internationally you know, in the UK, the US, uh, Kenya, South Africa, Cairo, South America, you know, th those were some of my kind of daily relationships and communications. So coming back into the Irish AT sector and, you know, meeting and finding out what people are doing, you know, I'm learning so much, you know, as well as working in an area that um, I think is just so important. So, so that's me. Fabulous. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I thought I had an interesting backstory. It doesn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't even c c compare. And uh, I keep threatening to be one of those uh, late career PhD um, students, but uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, the, I like, I like the idea, but uh, maybe the, maybe the execution um, might be the, might be the bit I struggle with. It's really interesting. You just mentioned the forum there, and, I, and I've spoken, uh, as you know, to several people um, who've been involved in forum projects or, mm. or, or um, and I suppose the, the forum for myself, and just speaking a, a little bit personally here, was the first time I got to work with people outside of my own institution um, and, and indeed made some lasting friendships um, mm -hmm. that have stood the, t the test of, of, of time, in, including uh, our first guest on, on this um, series of podcasts, uh, the 
the um, inimitable uh, Tom Farley. Um, <laughs> so Tom and I first met on a, on a forum project that we were working on. I possibly wouldn't have met uh, wouldn't have met otherwise because I do think a lot of the time uh, and a real value in the forum is that sort of cross pollination between institutes. A lot of the time, people are just so busy doing their own job that um, you don't get the opportunity to look around uh, or, or, or maybe benchmark yourself against um, what other people are doing. And I suppose that leads us on nicely in, in talking about benchmarking. The biggest part of work, piece of work that you've been doing with the forum most recently has been the index survey, which was launched just a little over a, a week or 10 days ago now, I guess, at this stage. Um, the launch event um, from, from Terry's couch looked absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I wondered how it was going to go. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it seemed, to, uh, it, 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 it seemed to go really, really well. So, so maybe you'd like to talk to us a little about a, a little bit about the the index survey, and maybe some of the the top line sort of takeaways that 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 you saw coming out of it. Yeah, um, I'd be happy to. Um, yeah, I mean, it was it's the index survey, the Irish National Digital Experience Survey, and you know, it was decided really kind of early in 2019 that we would try to you know gather an evidence base of the digital experience of students and staff who teach. And we had the choice of either developing our own survey or adapting uh, a survey that already existed. So we looked at what was out there and the, the Digital Experience Insight Survey, originally developed by JISC, um, met a lot of our needs. And then what happened was a several month process um, between ourselves as the National Forum and representatives from each of the participating institutions, those 32 institutions, uh, as part of an index steering group. To, to determine you know, what were the specific aims that we wanted to achieve, how could we adapt that particular survey and still preserve the international benchmarking that using that survey would give us. Um, and you know, so that work went on from say spring to September 2019 and then the survey ran in October, November uh, last year. So, I mean, we gathered data from almost 25 and a half thousand students and almost four and a half thousand staff who teach. So it was an incredible body of data. And really, you know, the report that was published two weeks ago is the first pass, you know, at that, that, that data. We, we, you know, we're trying to be really clear about that in the report. There was an urgency around, uh, you know, even before the current um, COVID cr um, crisis, there was an urgency around getting the data out there, you know, to the institutions, to the sector, with kind of a first pass understanding of it nationally. Um, so we're happy to have done that, but really what comes next will be based on a lot of you know, ongoing collaboration with the steering group and people across the sector about what would next be useful around you know, understanding this national data. And it's, it's so diverse, the data set really about students and staff describing how they experience digital. Um, but we really identified five themes, which hopefully makes it easy for people to go into this you know, vast amount of data and really explore you know, a particular area. So, you know, the theme one is, you know, digital teaching and learning practices. So what, what are students doing uh, and what are staff doing around teaching and learning online? Um, collaborating, assessment, using the VLE and so on. And then theme two is around digital infrastructure, you know, Wi-Fi and teaching and learning spaces, all those things. Um, theme three is around digital skills development. Again, how staff and students um, experience that. Theme four is around digital environment and culture. Because uh, this is so key. It's not just about, of course, um, what happens, you know, in the classroom, be that virtual or physical, but you know, what is the what is the overall culture um, around digital and 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 policies and structures uh, around reward and recognition, for example, within institutions. And then theme five is where we we give students and staff their their own voice. It's it's not so much about the responses to set questions, but you know what their recommendations are around you know, what, what they think could be done to enhance digital teaching and learning. So, you know, it is, it is a, an accessible way to access the data, I think, but probably best understood in specific contexts. So, you know, only you can, for example, in your institution will know what you're trying to do around digital teaching and learning, and even within that, in particular disciplines, what they're trying to do. So, you know, once, once you take what you, what you know about your immediate context with the data, uh, then you can really make sense of it and um, and hopefully use it um, to enhance practice. Yeah, absolutely. But it, I mean, at the same time, it did give us some sort of big picture, um, high level sort of overarching um, stats to do with 
national uptake. And I think one of the ones that surprised me, I guess, most was was one of the figures. Um, I, I might probably get it wrong, so but it was in the high 60s um, of staff who wanted to use more technology um, in, in, in their teaching. Um, the reason it surprised me, I suppose, I guess, a, a bit is that um, in my previous job, um, prior to the role I'm doing now, I would have been sitting alongside staff helping them make better use of uh, tools like the VLE. Um, and I probably thought they were a bit more reluctant than that. Um, so maybe, you know, faced with a survey, they, 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 they seemed a bit, uh, a bit more keen. What, what I did think, I suppose, and maybe what the, the nuance in that, and as you said, you need to contextualize back to your own discipline and, and, and that, the, the professionalism of, of Irish educators is such that I, I've always been overawed by how much they want what's best for their students. Um, they know their students are in the digital space because you know mm -hmm. there's no putting that genie back in the bottle. Um, you know, there's no none of us are, are throwing away our smartphones and going back to uh, a Nokia fifty one ten or whatever it was. I can't even remember the numbers anymore um, because you know once you have that convenience of flexibility and, and you. you it's surprising how fast you adapt um, and adopt to that way of working that, you know, going back just it, it is no longer an option. So in some cases, um, maybe staff may well have been brought along reluctantly, but I think a, a lot of the time it makes their jobs easier as well. And, and I've always been struck by, you know, me trying to teach um, or show or demonstrate how to use the VLE as a, at a conceptual level was difficult but if i was putting it in the context of well tell me what it is you want to do and mm -hmm. let's figure out how um we can use the technology to best mm -hmm. uh, suit that more often than not that 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 always paid um paid 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 big um paid big dividends in terms of your student numbers i think you were you were sort of looking at twenty five thousand plus students um right. and and was there any kind of standout takeaways there in terms of um, older versus younger students, or was was there anything that jumped out at you as that, that that you found unusual? Yeah, it was predominantly undergraduate, and there were you know in the front part of the report we we highlight where there were some differences from kind of the national profile, um, and there are some, but they're not significant. There, you know, it, it we thought that was a good reflection kind of of the national um, population of students and we you know throughout we just we observed differences across various you know um, demographics and so on and you know those are interesting but again you know best understood in context probably the comparisons that um, that might be most interesting to people are that there were questions on the student survey that were linked to questions on the staff survey and this was um, you know one of the reasons we really did want to do uh, a survey of both Population. So at the same point in time, we were able to ask related questions to students and staff, and that's fascinating. Um, so, you know, we asked students, uh, you know, to what extent maybe does the, do you feel that the, your institution protects your online safety? And then ask staff, you know, how much do you feel that you're informed about your responsibilities um, with regard to, to you know, uh, helping students preserve their online safety? Um, and again, you know, these are best understood in institutional context, but that kind of pairing of student and staff um, findings really illuminates things i think in a lot of ways around data privacy around online safety even around as you said first um, to what extent do you do you want to use digital you know in your course and there's a real you know i think the first finding in our key takeaways was you know there definitely is a, a kind of positive aspect to the way students approach digital for learning you know the, the overwhelmingly students said um, they felt that use of digital in, in teaching and learning enabled them to be more independent, um, to learn more easily, um, to enjoy learning more, those kinds of things. And for staff, you know, a lot of them were quite ambitious about, you know, wanting to use digital um, to enhance, you know, digital pedagogies, you know, that they're, that they're trying to implement. So, um, so there's an awful lot there. And we did build, I, I want to acknowledge, you know, just all the collaborative work that's been done across the sector. It wasn't just me coming in and, you know, um, working with a group, you know, and, and the National Forum team for the past year. The, the index survey really piggybacked on this very collaborative nature of Irish higher education that's, that's developed over the last number of years and work that's been done by the forum before. So, 
usually that digital experience insight survey when JISC runs it, they, they, they implement it at one institution and that institution goes back to JISC and JISC, you know, then publishes their overall report. Whereas in our case, we had the national forum acting as kind of an in-between layer between all the higher higher education institutions using the relationships that we all have together um, and the understanding that we've built. So I, I think there's a richness there, you know, based as I said, on the work of a lot of people, you know, over the last number of years. So hopefully, you know, people can see that, you know, reflected. Yeah, and no, I mean, the, sh the sheer size of the data set is, is highly impressive and, um, I've no doubt the into the detail will 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 show up um all sorts of um interesting um uh questions uh and and perhaps uh, ans answers as well um I probably was happy to see that um maybe digital is more mainstream than we might have thought it was um and and that's probably even more relevant to the situation we find ourselves in right now because um, interestingly at the moment all education is digital you could you could almost argue in that um, you know I'm sitting in my home talking to you um, you're you're sitting at home actually even the launch of the the launch of the of, of the survey <laughs> results was was all done virtually and um, I think it's 10, 10 weeks now since I've seen um, the WIT campus. I, I believe it still exists, um, but for the most part, our campus is digital now and our students interact with us digitally. Um, I, I did wonder, is, is part, uh, you know, all of the building blocks have been building up to this point. Uh, now, we didn't expect that it was going to take a global pandemic to push us uh, right, over the, mm -hmm. right over the edge. Um, but I, I know, uh, and it's a, it's a quote that I've used before, er, Ernest Hemingway in, in the, the novel The Sun Also Rises, well, the main protagonist is how we ended up going broke, uh, how we ended up going bankrupt. And he said, slowly and then very suddenly. Um, and I'm just wondering, has our adoption to, of digital happened slowly and then very suddenly? Because if you take it, you know, 10 years ago, if a global pandemic hit, uh, I don't think the Irish uh, HEIs would have been able to respond the way they have this time round. And um, certainly if it was 15 years ago and 20 years ago, it would have been uh, completely um, uh, unimaginable. Um, mm -hmm. I know a little over 20 years ago and, and getting back to your introduction at the start, I was thinking of all the different things you did. And about 20 years ago, I was running a, a, a website, um, which sounds like a great idea now, but Bearing in mind, there was only about five percent of the Irish population online twenty years ago. Um, it was a little bit, uh, a little bit of a harder perspective. So, would I suppose that, that getting to a, a question and all of that, would you agree that the the survey perhaps pointed, uh, and I, I appreciate things have changed since then, but perhaps pointed to we were better positioned um, digitally and to be able to cope um, as a result of, of COVID-19, then, then maybe we, we would have thought we were going to be. Yeah, I, I think absolutely. And I think within institutions and without institutions, because one of the things, you know, anybody who works in the area of digital literacies, digital competences, digital fluency, digital capabilities, knows that one of the objectives of that work is, you know, trying, trying to support people in their use of digital in their lives, you know, not just, um, you know, using the VLE or completing an, an assignment. So that's immediately important, but how that integrates, you know, with all, all the other ways that you interact with the online web, you know, do you use Wikipedia? How do you use Wikipedia? Do you understand, you know, how, how, how knowledge is generated and debated in Wikipedia? Um, how do you integrate informal and informal learning networks, practices, identities? Um, so yes, absolutely. And within our institutions, without question, um, we, you know, we were, we were, we were strongly situated and well prepared. Um, and also I think we probably, uh, each institution um, and the sector can identify places where we, you know, where we, we need to build more capacity. Um, so, you know, the index data tells us some things, um, but what's going to be, I think, also so important are these, the narratives, you know, the, these kinds of conversations that you're having, Ken, and many, many other conversations in the sector kind of capturing 
people's experiences and what they've learned. You know, uh, Kate Bowles use a lovely, uses a lovely expression about, you know, our storied selves, you know, kind of capturing in the moment, you know, how people have experienced the shift, because that can tell us an awful lot as well, you know, as much as the data that we've gathered in the survey. And, you know, all together, you know, we really need to leverage that to be able to go forward because things will be different for some time, won't they? Absolutely. And, and even trying to figure out um, what, what next semester is going to look like at this remove is proving to be um, challenging, uh, I suppose, is the, is the polite word. There are other words that I could use that are um, <laughs> uh, pos possibly less polite. And, and you're right, of course. Look, I mean, data um, is only the survey responses of, of one individual, but they are all individuals at the end of the day, and they all do have uh, individual stories and individual lived experiences, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I'm acutely aware of that. I do think there's a power in, in the numbers, though, and that it kind of gives you a, a broad feel for um, the, general, the general trends or the general trust of things. In, in terms of, um, I suppose, y y your own response um, to the, to the COVID-19 crisis and, and shutdown. I, I presume you haven't been to Dawson Street uh, and the National Forum offices in, in, in some time, um, and, but you've still managed to, 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 to obviously work away and you had, you had your launch. Um, how have you found the response to, 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 to the, to the clo closer? Oh, goodness. Um, well, on the 12th, I'm sure we'll all remember, you know, every hour of that day on March 12th, those of us who were involved in, in education at any level, um, from the announcement to what next, to you know, scrambling to change plans. Um, we, it, the National Forum in the, certainly for, for our own sake, we had a National Forum um, uh, Associates meeting that day, which, which was happening online anyway, we had, we had already planned that, but we, you know, we asked some key questions that day and responded. And one of the, one of the key requests that afternoon was for, you know, resources and kind of a central place to be, for, you know, how can we tell what everybody else is doing and where are the key resources that we're going to need, you know, to make this shift. Um, so the team, you know, like, a, like teams all, all over the sector, we scrambled together and, and, and pulled together some, you know, COVID, 19 institutional closure related resources around teaching online, learning online, assessment online, designing assessments uh, for online. Uh, we created a, an Excel spreadsheet which uh, enabled people to just input, you know, their pages themselves. And, you know, we've gotten a lot of good feedback on all of those resources. And, you know, we'll just keep those, those will keep evolving. So um, I suppose our, the National Forum has, has connections all across the sector, you know, at a number of different levels from senior management to individual educators and students. And, you know, that continued through this crisis. So we tried to respond to, you know, students via the USI and other student organizations, um, working very, very closely with the department. Terry McGuire is on, you know, a number of different um, groups, you know, responding to things, you know, currently. So, you know, we're doing our best, uh, asking a lot of questions, I think, as, as the forum often does, you know, what do you need? Um, and trying to respond to those needs. Yeah, no, actually, it, it is one of the things that struck me, certainly in the, the early days after the 12th and, and maybe the 13th, 14th, 15th of March, the, the amount of um, resources that were shared by yourselves and, and, and indeed others. Um, and there's been a tremendous... Um, I suppose solidarity of we're, we're all in this together and mm -hmm. you know here's what we're doing um this is what's working for us or we tried this and it didn't work um or here's this great resource that that i found online so um that kind of 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 sharing um and i guess openness um has been uh one of the uh, silver clouds in 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 what is 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 an otherwise um, very difficult um, conversation, and I suppose that probably ties in nicely to, to the next thing I was about to ask you about because before um, the index survey, and you briefly mentioned in, in your introduction there, um, your interest in in open education, and I know you have a a webinar coming up um, just next week on creating and sharing open educational resources. Um, so perhaps maybe. We, we could talk a little bit um, around the, your, yeah. your open philosophy. 
Absolutely. And, you know, there's a, there is a lovely connection there, as you just said, because, um, you know, the affordance of digital means that, you know, we can access so much of, of what other people have created. And open is a layer on digital that enables anyone who's created, you know, any, any resource to say, I've created this and maybe of use to other people. I'm not just going to send it out into the world, you know, on YouTube or, you know, on a website or whatever. I'm going to layer this open license onto it, which lets people know wherever they find it. So this resource travels around the web. People share it with each other. Whenever they find that resource, this license communicates with them exactly how they can use it, reuse it, repurpose it for their students, you know, whether they're in Dublin or Cairo or wherever. Um, and that's really the philosophy of open. So even that spreadsheet that we created, you know, in the national forum, that was, you know, we knew, you know, from the earliest moment that we don't need to create all new resources. We did create some new resources, but really curating existing resources and sharing that with people is often as valuable, you know, and enabling reuse. So, I mean, that philosophy is open as something that I've, um, has been part of my life really as a, as a learner and as, as someone who's, who's taught in higher ed for a long time and just, you know, facilitating students to navigate the open web, to, to know how to act wisely in terms of how to use what they find, what they can and can't use, um, how to create a presence and create resources on the open web and share those. And in, so in coming into the National Forum, the National Forum has, has that philosophy as well. So the National Forum, like the EU, like so many other national and public bodies globally, is committed to sharing, you know, all of the resources that are developed um, openly, you know, kind of contributing to, you know, the public sharing and co-creation of knowledge, basically. Um, so the National Forum uses the most, one of the most open licenses that you can, a Creative Commons license called CC BY, which means, you know, you can do whatever you want with it, all you have to do is, is attribute, you know, the National Forum. And in addition, um, any National Forum funded projects or initiatives are asked to also share all of the resources and materials that they create openly as well. So, you know, we've, we created the Open Licensing Toolkit last year with some advice about how to choose a license, how to, you know, how to add a license to something you've made. Um, and we're piggybacking on that with this webinar that's happening next week. Um, I'm going to be speaking with three people who who created resources as part of National Forum projects over recent years and ask them how they chose the license they did, um, what they know about who's reused their own resources. Did they reuse any open resources in creating theirs? Because this is all a chain. Um, you know, we're kind of building on, on one another, standing on the shoulders of giants, as they say. Um, and we really want to facilitate that. So that's what next week's webinar will be. It's an hour webinar. And um, I think you, you'll probably have the, the, the link in the show notes, but if anybody wants to know anything about what the National Forum is doing in terms of open education, it's um, all of the materials are at teachingandlearning.ie forward slash open, including the link to next week's webinar. Fantastic. Yeah. So it's, it's for, for those listening, and I will link it up in the show notes as well, but it's the 20 years of May uh, at 11 a.m. until midday is what's telling me on your, right. on your, on your site. I know I've registered for it myself and, um, I suppose from, from my own um, interest, I like the idea of open uh, educational resources. I just probably don't know enough about them. Um, I know the, the, the Gastigo's global project that, has, that I was involved in um, with the aforementioned Tom, uh, all of the, the video resources from that uh, are CC BY. Mm -hmm. um, and I probably should make uh, all of my Who Zooming Who videos um, CC BY. I just haven't um, gotten around to putting the, put the, 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 the label on the website, but I will. So that, that'll be my... Um, that, that'll be my homework for, for it's for easy to change the standard youtube license to uh to a creative commons license okay yeah, yeah I, I i'll definitely do that uh, after today so in in terms of we've we've spoken about the index survey we've spoken a little bit about your your, your open philosophy and in the middle there we, we, we touched a, a little bit um on the COVID 19 crisis and the response now but where where would you see it going from here? I mean, what do you think the lasting legacy um, for the Irish H, H, higher education sector, or, or perhaps even the Irish education sector in general? Um, because mm. it's not that uh, higher education doesn't exist um, in, in, a, in a vacuum. Obviously, there's inputs coming from second level. Um, mm -hmm. So so what, what do you think the lasting legacy um, of this 
Uh, I've seen it described as the biggest experiment ever um, in in education. Um, so what, what, what are your own thoughts on that, uh, Catherine? Well, uh, it's a big question and, you know, I don't know that I have the answer, but from my own perspective, um, I have heard many people talking about the importance of care and communication in what we are doing and whether that, whether you're, you know, um, a learning technologist or educational developer supporting, you know, one lecturer who's, who's figuring out how to, you know, to run an assessment in engineering, you know, online or a final exam online to someone who's teaching hundreds of students, you know, to, to someone who's working in senior management. Um, everyone has made enormous contributions in, in going above and beyond. And, you know, we need to honor those contributions in the moment. And I also think in the coming months. So, you know, we have done something as a sector and as institutions and as individuals, that's, that's amazing. Um, but perhaps to expect, you know, that same, you know, that same effort on, on a continual flow, you know, over the coming, uh, coming months is not reasonable. You know, we need to make sure that we're, we're looking after the people um, in, in our context, our students, our staff, um, and so on, figuring out what they need, not just in terms of professional development and support and training, but, but you know, care, communication, space, arrest after, you know, after the current exams and so on are over. So care, communication, trust, um, you know, once again, the, it com it's the people and the relationships, you know, that's what makes all this work, you know, uh, it's not the, it's not the, the, the technology, it's the people that, that use the technology. Uh, I, could, I couldn't have, I absolutely couldn't have said it better myself. And, and look, technology is only a tool, um, and it's only a tool to enable, I suppose, communication for a large part, because most of... Um, most of what happens uh, in digital education is about facilitating communication um, and communication happens between people and individuals and personalities. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, you, you touched on lots of really interesting things there that we could probably talk for several more hours uh, about. Um, but, but care and, and, and just showing that you care, uh, I think that's the bit that has kind of shone um, true for a lot of people. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right, of course. Um, the breakneck speed that all of this has happened at, uh, it can't be sustained uh, indefinitely. Um, and there will have to come a time when, when there's a, maybe a pause for breath um, and then some time for reflection as well. Um, I, I would like to think and I would like to hope that while recognizing the fantastic work um, that lots of individuals have done individually and collectively, um, that we need to be able to ask the hard questions as well, or you know. So we've done lots of things right, but we didn't do everything perfectly. Um, and while lots of people were got to the end of their their their, their semester or indeed their course, um, are 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 their, are around their credential, you know, inevitably there were some people left behind, and and there probably needs to be questions asked to um, why that was the case, and and an examination of what the causes for that, for those people getting left behind were and how we can address that, I suppose, moving forward. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think that is so important, um, Ken, and it's certainly one of my motivations for, for working in, in open education, certainly, is, is that that really foregrounds, you know, equity, kind of, you know, making education and educational materials um, accessible to as many people as possible. Um, trying to do what we can about the digital divide, which has only been exacerbated, you know, in this current situation. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think, uh, you know, it certainly is, is included in the recent index report as well. You know, these, that, that these considerations must be to the fore as we move forward. Absolutely. Can I say one more thing just about the index survey that, that, while, while you're talking? Absolutely. No, no, you can say as many things as you like. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that wasn't in the very first version that we published was actually a link to the actual data, the Excel spreadsheets with those appendices with all the national and international benchmarking data. So, you know, anybody who downloaded the reports on the first day, I just encourage you to go to the website um, just because we, we edited, edited them slightly to include those links. So, you know, all, we could have just shared that with the steering group, but again, in the interest of openness, uh, we, we wanted to make that available to everyone. So. 
just encourage people to access those. It's excellent. So anyone who's a, a bit of an R nerd or something can have lots of fun playing around with um, playing around with data. Won't be me, by the way, but you know, somebody else, somebody else. We've been talking for a little over half an hour at this stage, which I believe. Um, I've said this every week, so I, and it's becoming a cliche at this stage, but time certainly does fly with, when you're having fun. And um, these conversations uh, are, are always um, fascinating, uh, fascinating for me. Um, but all that remains for me to say is, Dr. Catherine Cronin, you've been um, very, very giving and very open with your time. Uh, so thank you very, very much for that. And um, the best of, best of luck in the future. Thank you so much, Ken, for your generosity. Thanks.